Hey, Jeff. And there we go. All right, we're recorded. Step number one recorded. Step number two in the chat, I just shared a link to the slideshow. So if you'd like to do a split screen thing and watch the slideshow on your own while you're listening to Jen and Shannon take us through, uh, that'd be great. So great to have Jen and Shannon here, two of our amazing co cohort coaches, cohort leaders uh, here at Reimagine Law Ed, as they're going to be talking about the five steps to creating engaging students in distance learning with choice and voice. So I'm so excited to have you here. Again, that link is there in the chat. You might also, if this is the first time you've been in a webinar, you might notice a webinar is a little bit different than a video, or sorry, than a meeting in Zoom, in that you don't have any video rights whatsoever. Uh, so you are more, you are an attendee in here. Down at the bottom of your screen, hopefully most of you have found the chat Make sure that you, uh, in the chat, make sure the little blue button in the chat says all panelists and attendees, not just all panelists. Otherwise, only the three of us get to see that. So you're going to want to make sure that you change that little blue where it says two to all panelists and attendees. Also down at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A section. The Q&A section is where you get to ask questions. And not only can you ask questions there, but you can also upvote other questions. So the questions that are upvoted the most are the questions at the end of this, we'll make sure get answered live on the air. You can also type answers to each other, support each other in answering those questions over there as we get moving as well. So that's it. I will one last time post the link to that presentation if you want to view it on your own screen there. Uh, and then I know Chrissy and Bob and other people over there are going to, or will help me uh, to co constantly review that as well. And with that, Jen and Shannon. All right, am I good to on. share my screen Look, now? Looking forward to this. Yes, go ahead. Let's get okay. this started. This is going to be great. I've got my notebook ready. I'm ready to take notes. Oh, no. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Oh, my gosh. Thanks for being here on who would have guessed it? One of the nicest days that we were going to have well, that we've had so far this spring. So we're so glad you're here. Shannon and I are extremely excited to share our thinking about creating engaging lessons where we really involve the students with choice and voice. So Shannon, who are you? Well, I am Shannon Cunningham. I'm a fourth grade teacher at, at Black Diamond Elementary School, which is in the Enumclaw School District. I have been a teacher for four, or 15 years. I have taught grades three through six, and I have been a technology leader within the district for the last, I think, about seven years. And I've been a one-to-one -one teacher for now four years. And I truly believe that every kid ha has the ability to learn. And it's just our job as teachers to figure out what the best formula for each kiddo is. Well, I could just kind of echo Shannon, but um, other than my name's different, I'm Jen Longmire. Uh, this is my 24th year as a teacher. I'm currently in the role of K-12 instructional technology support. I truly believe that as educators, we are constantly evolving to meet our students' needs. And as part of that, it is technology, but technology can't be taught as a standalone. It has to be just integrated as a part of what we do. So our hope is that you will see that it is not about technology today. It is about planning good lessons. It's about engaging students and it's about having fun in a career that we are passionate about. All right, so today what we wanted to do is go over what we feel uh, is five steps to creating engaging lessons. Our goal was to break down a planning of a lesson into what we think are five manageable steps. We're not going to say it's easy because it's not easy, but we do believe that the, if you go through these five steps, it becomes a manageable process. Manageable and impactful. Impactful, yes. Yeah. So step one is that guiding question theme, what is that enduring learning that you want your students to have? And we know with students able to Google or anyone able to Google anything and everything when they wanna know something at any time they want, that as educators, we have to start thinking deeper. We have to start thinking about what are the skills we want to focus on, not necessarily just the content knowledge. So, the, the question that I ask myself when I go to plan is what do we want students to remember 10 years from now? Now, if you think back to your school experience, mine was, oh my gosh, I realized the other day, almost 30 years ago. 
how many worksheets do you remember? I remember one. I do remember one worksheet and I remember it was fifth grade and it was that worksheet that my teacher gave me and it was the one that said, read all of the directions before you start and you read all of the directions and then all it says is at the very bottom, all you have to do is put your name at the top. I do remember that one because it was, you had all kids doing all sorts of different things because they didn't read all of the directions first. But other than that, I don't remember the worksheets I did, but I do remember my sixth grade teacher walking us through a survival unit where he had us take all of the stuff out of our desk and figure out how we were gonna survive in the wild for a week using only the materials in our desk. I do remember learning how to play chess in third grade. My teacher brought out all the chess boards and the pieces and we got to play chess for a week. We had um, a bracket and we got to compete with one another. And I, I remember that, that was third grade. I was, oh goodness, that was a long time ago. Um, I do remember in high school, I remember my, uh, when we went to go learn the UN, my teacher actually put us in a model UN and we had the security council in the middle and all the different countries on the outside. And I remember meeting and talking and negotiating and I really, it really brought the UN to life for me. I also remember in sixth grade, I think it was, or maybe it was fourth grade, we did a marketplace where we all created our own business and we sold products to one another and we helped each other out. And those were the things I remember, but I don't remember the worksheets. So we want to make sure that as we're creating lessons, we want the lessons to be things that they remember 10, 20, or God knows, 30 years ago, like me. Oh, this is me, right? <laughs> we, also, <laughs> we also want the learning to be authentic. We want it to be personally relevant. We want it to matter to the kids. Even if you're teaching third, fourth, fifth grade, how can this learning be connected to their current life? How can we make it um, something that they want to engage in, want to connect with, want to, to do? Uh, one of the lessons I created, the very first lessons I created in distance learning was a fort challenge. I remember as a kid building forts in my backyard. I remember building them in my living room and I decided to turn that into a lesson. My kids were engaged. They loved that task because it was something relevant to them and their level and where they're at at the moment. Uh, we want to make sure that if you're doing math, that you're doing real wor world problems, things that they connect with. Um, I know if like you're teaching history, we have a great history teacher in Enum class, Steve Murphy, who takes the learning and makes it relevant to current events. I know if I was a history teacher right now, I would be taking what we're going through right now, the pandemic and trying to connect it to the Spanish influenza because that's, that's what matters right now to many kids is what's going on right now. Creating budgets, what a great way to take a learning experience and make it relevant to students today. And that can be done at all levels. And as you're gonna see, we're gonna show some examples in a little bit that that choice can happen within parameters of what needs to be taught. So if you've got to teach about the Oregon Trail, you're still able to give choice and make it relevant to students within the guidelines of what your district is still saying that you are required to teach or what your state is saying that you're required to teach. We really want students to become 21st century learners and really um, broaden their horizons and make them contributors to, to their community and to the, to the world. So now we want to get you involved just a little bit. So over in the chat, we want you to think about all the things that you teach and we want, what do you want students to remember 10 years from now after they've left your class? What is that? enduring understanding that you want them to have. So go pop that in the chat. And as you start to look at the things in the chat, mm -hmm. these aren't content-based things for the most part. These are things that we believe are more important in being human beings than in knowing specific 
content knowledge. I haven't seen main idea yet in the chat. What? No main I, idea? No inferencing. I don't see that in the chat. Hmm. Yes, those are important skills, but that's not what we want kids to know 10 years from now. Exactly. All right. Keep throwing those in there. Shannon and I are going to keep talking so that we can actually, you know, get, get all of our information to you by the end. Okay. Step two, set your goals. What is it that you want kids to do? What do you want them to consume and produce? And the first time I heard these two terms like this was from our friend Julie Wright, who was a consultant that came to the Enum Classical District. And Julie said, what do you want your kids to consume? I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, how are we getting knowledge to our kids? What are all of the ways that they are going to gather the information that you want? So, you know, the first thing you think about is, well, books or articles. But when you consume things, it is everything around you that's going to lead to that knowledge. So it could be a book, it could be a cereal box, it could be a label, a video, YouTube, an article, an observation. It could be your next door neighbor that you, you see and you learn from. So when you consume, it's any place that you are able to get information from and, and learn from. And then once you have consumed, what do you want your kids to produce? And so our good friend, Bob, he always quotes, thinking with your hands, that's his big thing. You gotta think with your hands, you gotta build, you gotta produce, you've gotta make it your own. How do you let kids create unique projects? If we give them step by step and everything turns out looking the same, we've given them a recipe, not a project. So I think about when I used to teach art in my classroom and I thought it was great. I love art. I love getting kids to be creative. Well, I didn't really let them be creative. I was taking them through step by step. At the end of the day, we ended up with 25 projects that, yes, each one had its own little flair, but they all looked the same. I gave them an art recipe. I didn't let them just have free form art and create what they want. So when you give kids options in what they produce and how they show you their thinking and how they've taken all of what they've consumed and done something with it, then you start to see who your kids truly are. You give kids options for expressing their thinking and learning. This is where you can think about what standards you want them to meet with how they address the learning. You think about kindergartners. Are kindergarten students they can make choices about how they want to tell us what they've learned. Kindergartners are always ready to tell us what they learned. And then you think about our high school students. Boy, if we get to high school and our students can't consume information and then do something with it, if they can't think critically, we've done them a huge disservice. These are skills that all of our kids need to be able to do, making choices and deciding how are they going to share that learning with us and with themselves. All right, so again, we want to hear from you guys. How much time are your students consuming versus creating or producing? Where does the bulk of the learning happen? Is it happening during the consumption phase where they're gathering information from all sorts of resource or is it happening in the creating phase or the production phase, the create where they get to be creative and show what they know. So we want to hear from you in the chat. Would you put your comments in the chat, please, about how much time are they spending consuming versus creating? And we know that creation part's hugely important because from brain science, our, our kids have to start applying to retain. So if they're not applying, if they're only consuming, they actually haven't taken that next step in learning it and making it their own. Right. Jackie, you're absolutely right. Building background knowledge is important. Mm -hmm. We've got to give, and I think that we start to see that building some of those skills, the younger they are, the more that we're teaching some of those skills versus by the time they get to high school, they've got some of those skills already under their belt. We've got to be teaching them how to 
use and implement but can skills. that but can that background knowledge be built through the consumption phase and can they do it independently or does it have to be done by teacher direction mm -hmm. All right, keep those ideas coming into the chat. And should we head on to step three? Sure, although I saw Jeff, you posted something great in uh, the chat, but it's way far up now. Do you wanna talk about that really quickly? Um, I, I can, I was just I was just posted in the chat there, this idea of, and I think what I love where, where you guys are kind of talking about is, you know, when you start thinking about this authentic projects is how do we make sure that we're focused on um, the the system of doing what we would what we call project based learning versus doing projects and so it's a really great link if you can scroll up and find it uh, what's the difference between doing projects and project based learning because sometimes I feel like we we misinterpret those two on getting kids to do deep authentic learning through through projects or problems or inquiry based um, a lot of times we think of those in terms of projects but there's a difference between setting up a project as project-based learning and just having kids do projects absolutely and it's hard because we have to start letting go of some of that control yes we're i'm very much i want to be in control i want to make sure that everything's happening when it's supposed to and when you're truly having your kids engage we're that guide on the side we're not always in control <laughs> i don't know that, i don't know that i'm in control at all anymore <laughs> <laughs> i believe my role has shifted though from a teacher to a facilitator i make sure that the learning can happen i make sure they have the tools that they need but the process is really the students own that process absolutely all right shannon all right, so curating resources. Um, we've talked about consumption. It is an important part because that's where kind of the learning tends to happen. They get to fill their brains and feed themselves through the resources that are curated either for them or they curate for themselves. So when you're thinking about a project, it is then your job to go through and go on a resource scavenger hunt. This might be where you gather books that you like to use. This is teacher books or kid books that you want to use. You might want to look at your curriculum to see it, your district curriculum to see if there's a resource in there that might help you guide through the lesson that you're creating. But keep in mind your curriculum that the district has provided does not have to be where you start. This is using this as supplemental material or support material. Um, you might listen to podcasts or videos, read articles, talk to colleagues. Or I know for myself, I have created a personal learning network on Twitter where I gather my ideas and resources and use those to develop into lessons or add those to the lessons that I'm creating. So it's really important that you get the information that you need to support yourself and to support your students. Yeah, and don't forget to rely on all of your colleagues as well. We've got, the, like Shannon said, create that personal learning network, your PLN. You've got so many resources around you that we can offer up as choices for students that they can use in learning about this information. Mm -hmm. And I would say with that scavenger hunt, make sure you're giving choice. As you're gathering your resources, be keeping in mind, okay, what are some things I can give my students choice in as they are choosing how they want to learn? So I have, my son is a very visual auditory learner. A book is not his thing, but he will pop on a video or a podcast to gather the same information. So be thinking about how your students learn and giving them choices in the path that they want to go down for their resources as well. So since we're all here together and we're creating our own PLN, Where's your favorite place to go on your scavenger hunt to find resources? Let's put those in the chat so that we can start gathering a list of great places to find resources.
And after you've typed your place where you like to find, make sure you're scrolling through the chat. I know my chat is flying by faster than I can actually read it. So you need to scroll to go find some of those ideas. And then remember, as, we're, as Shannon and I are going along, we're, we're talking awfully fast and throwing a lot at you. If you've got questions that you want us to go back and answer, make sure you put that over in the question and answer area for us so that we make sure that we meet your needs as well. Teacher tube. Good. All right. <clears throat> Keep it coming. For step four, consistent structure. And we're going to spend a little bit of time right here because we've got some um, examples and things that we want to share with you within the consistent structure. So it's really important and it's become really evident with our distance learning that we've got to take the cognitive load off of our students and our families. So if they are having to try to figure out your system for giving them information, we've just added another layer of stress on them. So if we can take that cognitive load off their mind by creating consistent pathways, consistent structures that they can easily follow, we save that brain power of theirs for learning rather than for jumping through our hoops and trying to navigate our information. So as we start talking about these pathways of learning, these pathways span no matter what grade you teach. You can create easy, consistent pathways in kindergarten up to college, wherever you are. So let's go look through a couple of examples. This one is actually a second grade example of a Google Maps lesson. And I'm going to leave it in edit mode right here so you can see all of the slides along the side because I want you to see how easy it is and the setup of it. So pretty simple introduction of Google Maps. Challenge one, laid out nice and easy visuals to help. And then an example, an image that they can look at. And as we click through, Oh, we've just introduced some vocabulary as well that those kids didn't even know it. And now here's challenge two. Now what are you going to do with Pegman? And then a question, can you go back in time? So as you look at this, challenge three, very easily set up. Bullet points, let the kids know that there are different things to look at and to see. Oh, look it, I'm a map explorer, woohoo! And then now you're ready for adventure. So that was teaching the kids a tool. So that wasn't really a lot of choice in there for them. It was simply teaching them a tool in a very consistent structure. But now when I click, let's go on an adventure, embedded right within that very simple layout is this Google Adventures map. And here are all of the places that kids can go explore and it's their choice. What are they interested in? Maybe they want to look at space because they just saw something about, you know, the rocket that didn't actually get to go to space yesterday. But it's going to go on Saturday. I've got a good feeling. It's going to go Saturday, Jeff. I, we're going to keep our fingers crossed. Or maybe they really love cars mm -hmm. or parks. So you've given a wide range of areas that they can go explore and then they have an area where they can go share their observations. It's extremely well laid out, easy for kids to navigate. They're not hunting and pecking and trying to find something. Easy for kids and easy for parents, especially because the parents are the, in the teacher role right now. We can't be with our kids right now, so the teachers are doing, or the parents are doing it, and the parents can navigate this. Absolutely, and we know right now, especially the younger the student, the more or the parent is, it ha is needing to be involved. And our younger students' parents are maxed out. They are done, they're tired, they're ready to throw in the towel. So if we can take that cognitive load off of their shoulders and just make it simplified, we get our parents back on board as well. Mm -hmm. So this next example actually is from Shannon. 
And Shannon's like, oh, don't share this one. I've got a better one. I want you to share a better one. And, and I said, no, I like this one because of how it's set up. I think it shows really well how to create this pathway that includes choice and voice for kids. So you've got your main slide. Here's a little bit of information. What I love about this that Shannon created is that everything for the most part stays within Google, this Google slide deck. So she's got four choices. Giving kids choice does not mean you have to give them the moon, that they have to have everything available to them. She's given four choices. But if you click on this choice, take a peek, it says it'll pop you to slide four. So here's her choice. This one will take you to slide five. So let's go look at how these slides are set up now. Here's slide four, step one, step two, step three. You've got your video and you've got your click here for resources. Well, here's the other challenge. Take a look, step one, step two, step three, video resources. Each challenge or each path that the kids can choose is set up exactly the same way. They know what to expect. So if they choose to do more than one, they already know how to go in and navigate through this. Even her resources are linked to a page within the slide deck. And then these will take you outside to other places or they can go find their own. But for the most part, how easy is that to navigate for our younger students where it keeps them all in the slide deck and they're not having to navigate between tabs to try to get back to share their learning. Shannon, you wanna, you wanna talk more about this since this is your project? It is, and it's amazing because I noticed a couple of people in the chat and I've, in our sessions we've heard that students are dropping off. Kids are not engaged. We're competing with weather. We're competing with family situations. We're competing with parents just being done with school. But yet this was one of the activities that was mostly engaged in this week. I think I had 20 some odd kids do this activity. And I have to believe it's because it was the ease of it. There wasn't a lot of, they had to do some thinking and there was some challenge in it, but they had choice and it was simplified into three steps. And it was just something easy for them to navigate. I'm noticing that people are asking for copies of your slides in the chat. When you have the presentation up, you should be able to click on the same images and you will be able to see these again. Um, make a copy. If it pops it up, you should be able to go file, make a copy and you can make it your own. Look, Shannon, like we're already in there. <laughs> so one thing, one thing I'd like to just point out, because this is fantastic and people are just loving this over in the chat. And what I want us to start thinking about is remember that there is a difference. And I, this is the mindset that we need to start getting into as we wind this down this school year. There's a difference between emergency crisis distance learning and really good distance learning. Now, when we were focused on crisis distance learning, we were focused on what were some easy things that we could get to kids that give them choice over path and pace. So that's where our focus here at Reimagine Ed was really focused on the idea of a choice grid or a challenge board. And what we're seeing is what you guys are laying out here, which is so fantastic, is this is the next step because this just takes a lot more time, effort, and energy. Like I'm looking at this that you made, Shannon, and I mean, all the videos that are embedded, like this it takes, it takes time to do this. So this is the reason why we didn't roll this type of thing out through crisis mode is because it takes a lot of thought. But as we start to transition into next year, this is the type of stuff we want. That doesn't mean challenge boards don't go away, but it does mean that not every lesson needs to be a challenge board. There's a lot of different ways to give kids choice besides a challenge board, a bingo card, or a choice grid. And what I love about this is I think this is a perfect timing for this webinar for us to start thinking about, okay, now that I understand this idea of giving kids choice over pace and path, what are different structures? And this is a fantastic structure, every grade level, every subject area. So I really appreciate it. Well, and what I like about giving, doing something like this, yes, it does take time to kind of put this together, but yet if I were in my classroom with my physical kids and even my distance kids now, 
I, I'm done. Once I put this together, I can now, it frees me up to be able to support kids individually or in a small group, or they can independently work through this. So then it frees me up to, to take care of other tasks that need to be taken care of. And if you notice, Westward Expansion Oregon Trail is probably something you're required to teach in fourth grade. So she took a required piece of curriculum and gave choice and voice all the way through it where and, kids could be engaged. And I, I love the other little pathway things. And this is like, let's deep, I mean, we can talk about just this forever <laughs> right here, right? Like this is okay. So here's this like little things that my eyes are already moving to is like on this page, you have created an icon that is always click here for resources. And as you, if, if you scroll through this, Jen, you'll notice on every, anywhere that there is click here for resources, it's the same symbol that in itself is a pathway. So we're not gonna keep changing the symbol up on kids. We're going, to, we're going to show the structure, show you where to click for resources, and then every time you see that same thing, you start to, that, that is part of the pathway. Not only is it the slides, but it's the materials you use within the slide that allow, that allow the pathway to, be, to, to work. Um, and so there's, you'll just notice as if people are, people are opening this up and getting in, look for those little things, right? They're, all of those little things are also what makes this such a powerful learning experience. Oh, I love Adrienne's question. She just says, how do you differentiate through choice? That's the, the cool thing about this is you can go back to the choice board and a kiddo can go, yeah, I don't know that I really want to. I don't know why people would move west, but I can find, I, I know Google Maps, I can find the route along the Oregon Trail. So the differentiation is already built in. They get to choose their pathway. And I purposely, the, the, the questions kind of progress in, in um, what am I thinking of? Maslow's, not Maslow's, yeah, Maslow's hierarchy, where one, the first one starts out a little bit easier. And then that last one, what happened when the pioneers got to Oregon and Washington, that's putting them beyond the Oregon Trail and having to think a little bit more. And I did that one too, knowing I have five kiddos in my classroom who got to do this project last year because they were in my class as third graders. So I wanted to give them a bit of a challenge. So that was the question I came up with is what happened once they got here, which pushes their thinking a little bit more. And then the differentiation also happens in the resources that they choose to look at for their mm -hmm. particular area and then how they choose to show you what they can do. We all know what level our students are at. We all know what they're capable of. So you get a student who create something for you, you give them feedback and you continue to move them forward. You know if Johnny turns in something that is way below what he is totally capable of doing. So that's then where you start your differentiation. You start meeting kids where they are and you build in that culture of feedback so that your first go at it, you're not done with just your, your rough draft. You keep building and you making it better and you build that culture into your classrooms. So, so Shannon, uh, Gail has a question. Uh, did the kids then produce something? Because we were just we just got done talking about spending time consuming versus creating. Can you kind of talk about where through this experience kids had the opportunity to create? What did that look like for for your kids? For my kids, I it was in step three. So step one was to watch the video that I created, and my videos were just one minute, giving them a little bit of that background knowledge that Jackie had mentioned earlier. And then step two was to give them the resources to go out and learn something. And then step three is to share what they learned. And I, I wanted to give them choice on that too, because I have kids that love to draw. I have kids that love to write and I have kids that love to be behind a video camera. So I said, you know, you can do it in any way you want. Here are some suggestions I gave you. So I said, you know, they could record a video, write a letter. We spent a lot of time in my classroom before the closure creating infographics. So if they wanted to create an infographic, they could. They also know how to do stop motion animation using Google Slides. So if they wanted to do that, they could. I'm also trying to be mindful of the kiddos who are connected and not connected. So if you wanted to do it on paper and pencil, you could do that too. So I really wanted to leave it open-ended and get that creat creativity piece in with their product. And what I like here is that you gave three options of things that they could do. So for those kids, we know we all have them that, oh, I don't know what to do. Well, you've got three options right here, but then the dot, 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 
choose something. What is it that you want to create? If you can't think of anything there, it's already laid out for you of what you can do. I could totally see one of my students, Charlie, he loves doing Legos and blocks and things. I could totally see him making a Oregon Trail model out of his, his, cre his blocks and things. Is that okay? Yeah, in my opinion, I think that's an excellent way to express his thinking and to share what he has learned. Awesome. All right, any other questions? Anything else to say on Oregon Trail before we go look at a high school example? All right, here we go. So this example, and I'm gonna make it bigger for you, is from our friend, Steve Murphy. He is a high school teacher. And again, I want you to notice, this is on the Vietnam War. And I'm sure that's part of reminder, his- Steve teaches, um, what is it, 10th, 9th, 10th, 12th? I don't remember, he, but he is, this is a high school class. This is high school. So, his is very easily set up as well, easy to navigate, look along the side. What do we know? What are we going to do? What, what's that? what also? Reach out to me if you've got questions. So he's laid that out really nicely along the side. And then if you look, he's got video and under each thing, social, economic, and political. So how he's laid this out is really easy to see. He has, complete one of the learning opportunities, a video, a reading, a research, or activity for each of the three columns. So now kids get to choose what do they want to do in each of the columns. It's going to get them thinking socially, economically, and politically, and applying it to their lives, making it um, meaningful to the students. Lots of choice. He's embedded all kinds of stuff. And I love that down in the activity, you know, talk to someone at your house, a relative or a friend. And what if you don't have that? Okay, great. Here's a resource for you. Go ahead and use that. Again, even at a high school level with a curriculum that is mandated that you teach, look at all the different ways that Steve has embedded choice and the ability for voice for his students. Now, I know if I were a high school student and had gotten a just a PowerPoint slide with all sorts of information that I had to read, I would not want to do it. But when you put it in a grid like this with some fun colors and some titles and some, it makes me want to dig in. It makes me want to click and it makes me want to learn more. It's clean, it's neat, and it's easy to easy. navigate. Mm -hmm. To me, it's fun. The other thing I think about when I see things like this too is a lot of times when we are teaching and it's just because it's the way we've taught forever is in this, in this type of model. I mean, when he's, when he's teaching the Vietnam war, right, I'm sure somewhere in his curriculum, the three big ideas is the social, emotional and political impact of the Vietnam war. But usually we teach that in a very linear way. So usually we'll teach that where we'll teach all about the social impact and then we'll teach about the economic impact and then we'll teach about the political impact. But by laying out all three in a choice grid, you allow students to see the interconnectivity of all of that. Now, the other place that I think about this, that I think that we could really use things like this is in math and science. Mm -hmm. How often in math do we try to teach geometry outside of equations, when really geometry and equations should be together? Because they're equations that help you figure out the perimeter of a you know, of a square, or there are equations that help you figure out how to measure different shapes. And so be thinking about, I mean, it's all in our curriculum, but how are we, how are we allowing kids choice so that they see the interconnectivity of all of those things? Um, even, and I know everybody, you know, we hear all the time, they're like, well, I hear all the time from high school teachers. Like, well, that's so easy to do in elementary, Jeff. I mean, Jeff, you're an elementary teacher. You get to do interdisciplinary stuff all the time, but you can do this. You can do this just in math or just in science and getting kids to see because you're giving them choice. And by giving kids choice, they can start to see for themselves the interconnectivity of the relationships between the social, emotional, or economic and political impact of, of, one, of one event. And I just be thinking about how you can structure, even to your point, the curriculum that we have, but it's the way that it's structured through choice that allows kids to make those connections. And I think that's just such an important point to be thinking about. 
I also, I was just thinking while you were talking that I like this kind of activity too, because it gives the kids an opportunity to formulate their own thinking and their own ideas instead of being told how to think and being told a, a teacher's opinion about something. They get to formulate their own thinking on that and their own opinion. And what a great way to formulate or to uh, get a conversation going about this kind of topic. Absolutely. Okay, let's see. So we've shown you three different examples and we've talked about how important that pathway is, creating something that's manageable. But what if you don't even know where to begin with that? Well, guess what? There's this great thing called Google. And as soon as you start to Google templates, I, I found this one by accident when I was looking for a template for today's slides that we're sharing with you. And easy to go through. Look at activity one, title here, put a video here, put a sound bite here. Oh, takes you to Google Classroom. There are so many things out there that are embedded or already created for you that you just have to put in your information into the slides, your activities that you want to do, your choices, and make it your own. So if the format is, is a stumbling block, don't let it be. Go Google it and find something, a template that's going to work for you. And so those of you who are, you know, clicking, as you saw, there's links here, a link in this image, a link in the light bulb, and then this little black box that's just barely visible because I didn't want to make my slide messy. I just embedded a black box on the screen that when you click in the corner, you get magic. All okay. Right. I love Anything it. else in the um, example or in the examples in the chat room that... Uh... <laughs> so no. find something that works for you. Find a pathway and don't change up your pathway constantly for your kids. Find something when you find a pathway, you can embed all your different learnings, but your students always know how to get in and how to navigate where you are going. Nice. All right, Shannon. Now you'll notice we are in halfway through step four when we begin thinking about the tools we're going to use and the tools we're talking about could include technology. We want you to understand that creating engaging lessons really does not begin with the technology. It does not begin with the computer. I know with distance learning, we have to have that computer in order to hand out assignments and to collect assignments. But you'll notice our lessons were not designed with a tech app or a, to a technology tool in mind. What we did was we formulated our idea. We got our theme first. We wanted to figure out what it is that we want them to learn. And then we gathered some resources and some of those resources could be technology related. But now, now that we've got a path, now's the time to figure out, okay, what tools could I use to facilitate this learning? So if we go back to my example of the Oregon Trail, if I wanted to have kids maybe do a little quick brainstorm, a collaborative brainstorm. I could throw in a Padlet link and say, hey, once you've chosen the question you have, go to Padlet and let everybody else know what you have decided. And that gets a little collaboration piece. But in that activity, I didn't feel that was necessary, but it's certainly something you could do. Or if, if Steve was creating his Vietnam uh, choice board, he could create some sort of opportunity, a flip grid or something where kids could go in and collaborate with one another. But he's gotta make those choices once he has in mind the learning that he wants to see have happen. Jen, what did I miss on that one? Nothing. I think you covered it, but tech is just that. It's a tool. It's a tool that can enhance learning, but your good teaching and learning is good teaching and learning no matter what. And that's why the tools don't come in until this point. We didn't build an assignment or a lesson around, oh, I, I want to do this tool. I want to use this app right. because then it doesn't become as authentic. So you have to pull back and think about what is that learning? What are the skills that you want your kids to have? And then, okay, what tools can help with that, what tools can enhance that, and then give some options there. Well, and, and like, I think back to some of the lessons I've designed during this distance learning, like the Top Chef Challenge, that one could be done with or without the computer. They, their goal was to read recipes that can be done with or without the computer. Their goal was to cook some food with their family. Well, that's going to be done without the computer. And then they had to share their share a review of the recipe. Again, that could be done with or without the computer. So the activities, it's not 
creating engaging lessons is not about the computer. It's about the learning involved. And then the computer or the technology can enhance that lesson for sure, but that's not where you should begin. Absolutely. I had another thought, but of course it flew out of my head as you were talking, so I'm sure I'll come back to it. I bet it was a good one too. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the consistent pathway you use with your students? And what tools are you using to support learning? Well, that's a big meaty question. It is, man. What were we thinking with this one? You know what? With as much engagement as happening in the chat. I'm thinking they can do it. They're going to get this. So we want you to go back to that chat. And maybe your answer is, I don't know. I've got to go develop it. Well, that's great because that's what we want you thinking. But head back to that chat. Is there something that you're already doing that creates that consistent pathway? And what are some great tools that you've discovered that help your students in their learning? And maybe you discovered those tools today. Maybe. Maybe. We gave them some good examples, I think. Yeah. I like, I like the uh, comment about clickbait. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, Deandra, I am with you. Sometimes I can't sleep at night because I'm so excited to present a lesson to my kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Sometimes Google Classrooms can be your pathway if you organize it correctly. Yeah. All right. I'm going to move on. People can yeah. keep putting stuff over in that chat. I love it. I love it when it all of a sudden, you know, people are typing, 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 because then it just goes. It does. It goes fast. Okay, here we go. Outcomes. This is the end. This is step five. What is it we want to see or get from our kids through this process? So feedback, you know, how do you know if your students have met this outcome? So if your goal in the beginning was that they, you know, learn about the Oregon Trail, how do we know that they've learned that? Well, there's some theory of action. Some teachers think that you have to wait to the end to see if they have met that outcome. But there's some teachers that think if you are monitoring the process all the way through, having checkpoints throughout and giving them feedback throughout the process, then there's no need to grade that outcome. There's no, the outcome should already be predicted because you've gone through the different steps and you know they're getting through the process and you already know that their outcome is gonna be exactly what it needs to be. So you wanna make sure when you're designing projects like this or you're designing engaging lessons that you give kids opportunity to get feedback throughout the process. There was a great conversation today in one of my sessions about how students especially don't want to go back and change anything. If they get to the end of a, pro a project, they're done. They don't want to go back and revise. So you've got to make sure that as they're going through the process, they're getting that feedback to help them throughout so that they don't have to go back and revise once it is done. You definitely want to focus on the process. Um, also, make sure that you're giving opportunities for student self-assessment, giving them checklists to make sure that they know they can check, yep, I did, A, B, C, D, and E, I should be good to go. You also want to give them opportunities, like I think it was in Steve's, where they have an opportunity to share their thinking with somebody non-threatening, like a family member or a stuffed animal, or I told my kids too, if, if it, nothing else, go into the mirror and share your presentation to yourself and see how it sounds and give them that, that non-threatening way to do that before they turn it into you. And then you have to offer peer-to-peer -peer feedback as well. How do you build that system into your classroom so that students know how to appropriately give each other feedback to help along the way? And then yeah. think about this, that as soon as you get a grade, students are done. They're done. You lose that ability for feedback. As soon as that student has an, even though students get an A, that student is never going to go back and revise and and edit and make it better because they've got the A, they're done. So a grade, if you are giving just a grade, you have just blocked the ability for your students to get feedback and to improve. So we have to kind of start thinking about our, our mindset of 
it's only the final grade that matters rather than we need to look at the whole process. A final is okay. We want them to get to having something at the end, maybe, but it's that learning all the way through that is critical for them and your feedback and that culture of feedback, knowing that they can continue to improve even when they think they're done. We all know that first times through, we're never as good as we are when we do it the second, the third, the fourth time. So think about some of those things. Shannon, what else? You got it, girl. You got it. All right. Back to you guys in the chat. work. <laughs> How do you provide feedback throughout the process in your class? And how do students have the opportunity to self-assess? All right, dump it in there. Ooh, they're thinking. I know. See someone talking about Pear Deck in there. Oh, they love know. Pear Deck. Nice exit tickets. Google Form. Oh, I love Google Form. Mm -hmm. yeah. And remember in feedback when you are in distance learning. When you're face to face with your kids, they're hearing you and seeing you give feedback. When we're in distance learning, you've got to figure out ways to give feedback where they see you and hear you. It's not just written. That's yeah. so important because our kids still want to connect with us. So don't just think it's a quick email. Mm -hmm. High schoolers, oh, they can handle it. I'm going to give them a quick email. They need to see you and hear you no matter what grades you teach, giving them feedback. I love this. I had a student, I was reading his blog post and I'm, as I'm reading through it, I'm going, oh gosh, I need to help this kiddo. So I just quickly dialed up his mom said, hey, does, does Caleb have time for a video chat? Yep. He and I were on Zoom for five minutes. We went through, edited his work and you know what? He retained everything I taught him. And, and you, I watched, this was like four weeks ago, looked at his blog post this week. Perfect. Perfect. Capitals, periods, everything. He retained everything in that five minute lesson. It was awesome. Great. Okay. And a review of the five steps. So all the way from beginning with that guiding question at step one to step five, what were your outcomes? How do going through these steps help engage your students? Throw that in the chat. How do going through these steps help to create lessons that will engage your students? See, they thought they could just come and sit and listen to us. They didn't know they were going to have to respond have to so much in the chat. We wanted to keep you engaged. <laughs> they own their work. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Choice is motivation. I love a lot of the, the theme is it, you're putting the kids first, and that's exactly what it is. You put the kids first. Which is funny because if you go back to all of the things people said in what was your one thing, mm -hmm. they all had a theme around putting kids first, right? Yeah. I love that, 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 you know, when you start with that, when you start creating a pathway for students that focuses on that one thing, whatever that one thing is for you, right? That's the passion of, of you being a teacher that you bring to your classroom. But then you create a pathway that allows that one thing to shine through you're able to make sure that all of your learning then focuses on that thing that is that you want your kids to walk away from your class with. It's so cool. I love it. All right. All right. Should we? I love it. It's time for you to create your next great idea. Yeah. Before we let you go, though, I'm guessing there must be some questions, Jeff, in the chat. Oh, yeah. 
we've got some we've got some great questions in here for you. Um, so this is this will be good, and I think it'd be good for you to show people on. Uh, uh, Jen, this is probably for you, for you to show. So one of the most upvoted questions was, how do you present to students so it automatically is in present mode? Oh, oh. so what yes. they got? <laughs> yeah, they're like, that is so cool. Cause you know, when we're talking about making pathways, it's really good if kids don't see all of this. And let's be honest, when you're looking at this that we're looking at on your screen right now, there's a lot of buttons to click on for mm -hmm. a student. So I want students, I'm making my pathway in either in either PowerPoint or Google Slides. And I want kids just to be on, just to see the slides in presentation mode. So how do you force that for kids? So I go to file and publish to web. And then if you were running a slideshow, like I, I've done a, a picture slideshow before where I wanted the slides to automatically advance, you can choose to have slides advance. But if you just want it how you all got it today. And I'd have to, there would be a publish button right here, but since I published it for you already, it's a stop publishing button. And you just publish it to them. I then took mine into gg.gg to create a link that was a lot easier. Yeah, a URL shortener. Yeah. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. gg.gg. Yeah. Gg. Yeah. Doesn't everybody know that one? <laughs> There's a million well, of them the other there. thing I'll do is go in under where it says every three seconds. I drop that down to I think it's to the fat to every minute. Every minute. In case way. a kid accidentally presses play. Yeah. Yeah. Now the thing to remember, the thing to remember on this, if you just hold here real quick, where it says stop publishing, there it's actually a blue button that you'll have to hit that says start publishing. But if you don't click on, and you'll notice because Jen is inside her Enum Class School District account. You'll notice right there, there's a little button that will require viewers to sign into their school account. Now, if you don't click that, like Jen doesn't have that clicked, when it's published to the web, it is actually published to the web. Anybody with that link can view it. Now, do I care that any first grader can go through my slide? I don't, I don't care, right? So I just wanted to make sure people know that. But at the end of the day, this is how you would also share stuff out to your kiddos, your parents can see it. So. That, that box is there, but if you want your parents to have access to it without having to try to figure out their kids log in and what all that is, and let's be honest, if you look at that URL, I have never in the 15 years that I've been doing this ever had somebody anonymously stumble upon my random link. It just doesn't happen, <laughs> no. you know? So, but just know that that's how this is set up. And then you copy and paste that link wherever you want it and it automatically forces um, presentation mode for people. So uh, awesome. Easy. Okay. Next question. Um, what are some strategies for reaching ELL students? Do you have any strategies for reaching ELL students within this kind of structure that you're presenting today? Oh my gosh. I wish I had grabbed some examples because our ELL gal, Cami Went, has created some structures for her students that are easy pathways to go through. She has, she's working on teaching parents now how to use the Google Translate so that they can put things in a different language for themselves. But she has created a really nice pathway. Our ELL students need lots of visuals. So in most of these examples, there were lots of visuals. It makes it really easy for our kiddos to navigate no matter how old they are yeah. in ELL. And thanks, Michelle put into the chat too. Class Dojo has a translator built in. Uh, Immersive Reader has a translator built in. And I think if you, if, you, if you get out of this, I think also in Google Slides, and I know, it, I know for sure it's in PowerPoint because I played with it down uh, with the school. But if you go under Tools, I think there's a way that you can translate. Oh, no, it's not here. Okay, so there's just voice. So you kids can, vo can voice type their notes. So they don't have the trans, they don't have the translate over here yet. Like in Google Docs, you know, there you can translate any document into another language. I was wondering if they had it in slides yet, but it doesn't look like it's there. So. It doesn't look like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. Uh, next question. Do you have ideas on timelines, virtual versus in class? What are some good like timeline apps for helping kids make timelines if we wanted to timeline something else? Do you have any good timeline apps that, that you like to use? Padlet has one. I haven't used it myself. I'm using the map one this week, but Padlet has a timeline tool within it. And I, that, I would be interested to play with that one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 
Michelle says timelines in Google Draw. I love using Google Drawing. Mm -hmm. You can make a timeline really quick where kids would have to build it all out. Yeah. Um, there's a couple other really, there's a couple other really cool free ones if you, you know, Google free timeline creators. Mm -hmm. um, but there is one in Padlet. Padlet's got a fantastic little timeline thing that I've used in the past as well. Yeah, good. Thank you, Bob. Bob's just put in the ELL resources uh, from Enum Claw that you were talking about, Jen. So oh, oh, that's different. Bob, you're amazing. Thanks. Um, all right, next question. When students are making their way through the slide deck with choices, are they intended to press present and navigate that way? Mm -hmm. So if you weren't sharing it, if you weren't sharing your slideshow where you already had it in present mode, would like your first direction be on your first slide, like click present? Would you, mm -hmm. would you, would you recommend that? I would, and then my students also know that they're, if they're not in present, they can click on the image and it's gonna pop up below. So Jen, can you show? So I'll yeah. go back to my magic one. So if they were to accidentally click on this magical black box down here. The, oh. the link pops up. And my kids know that because it was taught to them before the closure, but certainly that would be something I would have to show them. I could create an asynchronous video through digital learning and show them both options. The one thing that's nice when it's in present mode, it's a one click to take you to the link. When you are in this mode, you have to click and then go click the attachment. So it's a two click in here. Versus yeah. in present mode, it's just one click and it's there. Right. Yeah. Um, next question. Do you have any clever ways to have students turn things in? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um. What's your magic? What's your magic to get kids to actually turn in the assignments? Oh, to actually turn them in? Yeah. No, I mean, it's my, um, no, I don't have a magic trick. I think the magic comes from developing the lesson that they want to do and they want feedback for. So yeah. my kids, right now with distance learning, I load the assignments on Monday and most of them are due that Friday. There's been a couple of projects that we wanted to give them more time. So it's been a two week time frame. but my kids want to turn it in because they want that feedback. They yeah, want to show I, me what they did. And I would say that, uh, you know, one of the things we have to remember is, is as we, and again, I'm thinking next year, I'm, you know, we're, we're getting out of this year's coming to an end. I'm thinking next year is one of the first things we do in our classroom in our physical classrooms is we set up that structure. Every teacher has a different structure to turning things in. And I can't tell you how many times, even in November, you still have to tell kids like, put your assignment in the basket, put your, like kids not turning in assignments is not a new problem. <laughs> yeah. But we constantly have a, we have a system or a structure that never changes. And I think that becomes the thing, right? You're going to set a structure. In your classroom, you have a structure of we turn in assignments over there, or we turn in assignments this way. So in your digital classroom, you also need to have that structure, that whatever that is. If you use Google Classroom, then you need to teach kids every single click that they need to do to turn something in. And that could be part of your pathway. So you might even have a video that you have created that you're going to use in every single pathway, just like every single day, you have to say, don't forget to go turn it in over there. Don't forget to go turn it in over there. You're going to create a video that says, and when you, you know, that walks the kids through. When you turn in your assignment, remember, log into Google Classroom, click on the assignment, click on turn in, attach your Google Doc, and you're just, and it, but make the video once and then embed it into every place that you need. Don't forget to turn it in. Just like in your regular classroom, you constantly have to remind the kids too. And so again, the hard part about making that video is you have to only say it once. Yes. <laughs> you make the video once and they have to hit play. Versus six times a day for six different periods, times 180 <laughs> times a year. Oh my gosh. Go watch the video. So much easier. One of the things I will do in Google Classrooms is when I'm loading the directions, I will at the very bottom, you will turn in this and this. <laughs> Oh, These I like are the that. pieces I need. And so they go and look, okay, did I turn this in? Did I turn that in? Yeah. I love that. Any, um, I'm trying to see here. Some other ones. Uh, where do you guys go for resources? 
we kind of answered that. That was all over the place. Um, so this is the, we'll end on this because this is the big question. It's got the most upvotes. There's been a couple people that have answered, and I really appreciate uh, Michelle and Josie in there uh, in the Q and A helping to answer this too. But we've been hearing this question, I think, a lot of late, and I'd love for anybody in the chat who's had um, who's had success with this. But the question is, and, and you both, I know we heard this today a lot in our cohorts as well, but the, the question is, what guidance can you give on convincing colleagues on the value and importance of project-based learning, student choice, creating pathways, um, et cetera? There are colleagues that can't move away from the idea of it's the curriculum, whole group instruction is a primary means for delivering content. So as, as a coach and as a team leader, school leader, Shannon, what are some ways that you have helped to try to convince colleagues in your school district to, to maybe try this or attempt this or um, do something different? Model, model, model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just kind of showing mm -hmm. and letting them see you have some success with it. And, oh, look at I have um, people sending me stuff on my Google Classroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just that model, and, yes. and a lot of times I think people don't move away from it. There's a lot of fear in yes. moving away from something that you already know how to do and that you think that you are doing well. It's a big risk. And I remember the first time we had, um, her name was Darla Wood Walter. She came to our school district many, many moons ago to do some kindergarten training. And I left that kindergarten training thinking, her way's never going to work. It's not going to work. And I'm so stinking stubborn that I'm like, fine, I'm going to try it her way for one year so I can gather the data to prove it's not going to work. Guess what happened? I was proved wrong. It worked. <laughs> what she had come and what she had shown us worked and it worked like a charm. But I, I think that there's a lot of fear from moving away. So I, Sometimes I think it's that quiet guide on the side where you're just modeling it and, and showing and sharing your successes. Um, and then collaboration, working together, continuing to collaborate. You know, there's no easy answer because there's always those teachers that just don't want to budge. And we I, I have one of the most amazing partners I've ever worked with. And I know she's watching because I just saw her go through the chat. And I love our partnership because I, I'm t I tend to be the one to jump off the deep end. I'm ready. I will grab on an idea. I do all my research ahead of time. And then I'll let her know, hey, I'm going to do this. And she looks at me like, uh. and then I jump in. And then as she sees me navigate it and get through the messy part, then she'll go, okay, I think I'm ready. Can I try? I want to try that. And she does. And, she, and I, I'm so amazed at how much she has learned through this distance learning and through our partnership together. But I learned just as much from her too. It's, I, to me, it's a, an awesome partnership. But I think it's just that modeling and being able to take risks and talking up your successes and letting people know it's okay where you are, but when you're ready to move to this step, I'm here to help you and here to support you as you need it. Yeah. And those relationships I, are super important. You have to have relationships first and foremost. We talk about that with kids that you have to have relationships. We often forget that with our colleagues because this is our job. Well, yeah. our relationships are vital because if you don't have relationships, you don't have trust. And if you don't have trust, you're not gonna be willing to go outside your comfort zone. Yeah. I like what Chris just said too in the chat. You have to be okay with the messy. And for most teachers and myself included, I am a control freak, or I was. I, I kind of converted myself, but still, I wanted to be in control of everything. And I felt if I let go of that control, then I wasn't a successful teacher. It took me, I, I went into flexible seating, decided I was going to do it. And I remember the first day of flexible seating, I'm talking to my partner going, I can't do this, I can't do this, just because it was so out of my comfort zone. But once I embraced that chaos, and allowed that to happen and allow and put some structures into place, I realized I can do this. And from there, I realized, you know what? I don't have to be in control of everything. I can, I, Jeff says it, I can set up the parameters, I can set up the structures, but then I'm gonna let my kids kind of guide where it goes from there. Mm -hmm. And it is very freeing, but you have to take that leap of faith that you don't have to be in control. You don't have to know everything. It's okay for your kids to know more than you do. Yeah. 
And as we get ready here, because we're about ready to sign off, um, I would just add with that, you know, one of the things that I'm constantly focusing on is this, this, and, and everybody that is watching this or listens to this in the future or watches this in the future already knows this, but they call it the teaching practice because we're constantly practicing at it. And if you're doing the same thing over and over again, that's not practice. <laughs> they, they don't call it teacher mastery, right? There's no, there's no such thing as a master teacher. Can we just stop using that phrase? Yeah. We're, we're, all, we're all in the teaching practice. And teaching practice means you're constantly trying something new. You're discovering things for yourself. The other thing I, I just, you know, as we get ready to sign off here is, is I think understand that the opposite of success is fear, not failure. And I don't think we can stress that enough, that the opposite of success is fear. And what failure is, is everything that you do right before you become successful. And so what we have to do is fail our ways to success. And you can only do that if you can get over the fear to try in the first place. Um, but if we can get to a place where we understand that failure, we celebrate them, we fail fast, we fail loud, we learn through it. Uh, and like Shannon said, you have a great colleague that is there to support you, that is even helping you in the moment, say like, uh-oh, I see the cliff coming, I can help you ahead of time because you're so focused that that doesn't always happen. Um, that just makes, it just makes teaching so much more fun. Uh, and I just love that about what we're doing. So thank you both so much for putting this together. Uh, the chat has been going crazy, which I love. If you want to save the chat for yourself, you can click on the three little dots down where you're typing in the chat. If you click on the three little dots, you should have a save chat option and you can save it right there for yourself. We are also saving the chat and it will be on the Reimagine WaEd website under the tab resources, where you will be able to, uh, again, view the entire presentation, uh, uh, watch the entire video, uh, download that, uh, that chat as well uh, as, um, there. So thank you both so much for giving up your time and energy. We so appreciate it. Uh, just a great way of showing the five steps that I think you can just, you know, use over and over and over again to create really authentic learning purposes for, for students. So thank you so much, guys. Thanks everyone for being thank here. You. Thank you all for being here, especially with it being so warm outside. I appreciate it.